in all labor, there is profit. Proverbs 14 and verse 23. In all labor, there is profit, but it, the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Now, let me have you go back to chapter 8, a few pages. Uh, I'd like to read it all, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to read a few of the verses in chapter 8 and in chapter 9. Look at verse 17. I love them. This is chapter Proverbs 8, verse 17. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall, what? Find me. Amen. And I think how, you know, it just tells us we need to seek the Lord early in the morning before we, our minds get so distracted. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold in my revenue than choice silver. I led in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. Let's just go on to chapter 9, and I encourage you to read all the way down through there. In chapter 9, wisdom hath built her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. And uh, go down to uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 8. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man. He shall love or will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me uh, thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. I'll, I'll stop there again to read that chapter as well. Uh, just an example of some great proverbs. A human proverb is a short sentence based on long experiences. But in Proverbs here, we have short sentences based on something far better than long experiences. It's based on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as given to Solomon. And so these are, as you read, and I know I appreciate Brother Morris in Sunday School encouraging all of us to read a proverb a, a day and be uh, challenged, be uh, 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 or, you know, gain wisdom of God. And uh, because these little proverbs are short sentences based on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as given to Solomon. Well, before we get into the message, let's have a word of prayer once again and just ask God to help us all. Father, we do pray for your help. Help me to preach this message with power, with clarity. I also pray for the listeners here today those sitting in the pew, those that may be listening or watching, uh, we pray that, dear God, you'd fill them with thy spirit so they can hear, understand, and apply what you'd have them to apply to their life. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today I have this message that I, I pray that the Holy Spirit will burn this in your heart and mind. And, and I pray that you'll understand the message today that uh, and I promise you, if you understand what the Word of God is stating on this subject, it will literally transform your life. I've never preached a whole message on this subject. I've alluded to it, but I believe this is the first time uh, uh, I've done this, and it's, it's a, a foundational truth in the Bible. I believe this truth can also be applied not only to our work, but for those of you who aren't employed yet, your school and, and how we uh, look at these matters. But uh, uh, Proverbs 14, 23, again, that one phrase, in all labor there is profit. Now I want to talk about the importance of, uh, of your work, that, that there is profit in every line of work. And again, if you understand this, this is going to transform your work. It, it's, it's going to change uh, 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 it, from a boredom uh, to uh, a blessing. It's going to transform the way that you perform your duties at work and everywhere. It's not going to be a drudgery. It's, it's not going to be monotonous if we understand this truth. And we're going to find that the same old grind uh, doesn't have to be that way in our, our thinking, our minds. Um, it, it, it can be glory if we understand what the Word of God states. You know, a lot of people that you talk to, I, I'm, at least I, I've known many people through the years that were just sick and tired of their job. They hated it. 
they hated going to work every day and hated clocking in and, and the whole thing. And I, I, I think to them, in, in many cases, their job was meaningless. And uh, that they, they think that some people have happy jobs. Some people have fulfilling jobs. Some people have jobs that are thrilling, but not me, is, was the attitude of many. And they, as one put it, they draw their breath and they draw their salary. It's just uh, the same old. They wake up in the morning, they, they uh, uh, take a, a shower, they shave, they, uh, I guess the ladies don't have to worry about that. But they, but they uh, eat their breakfast, they drink that hot cup of coffee, they're on their way to work, they're raced to work, they clock in, and it's the same old thing day after day. Then they come home at night after a long day of work, and uh, they may, uh, they're tired, they may... Uh, uh, watch some news or take in something just to kind of uh, relax and have a conversation with the spouse and then they're off to bed and there's nothing more uh, it seems to their life the next day the same old thing nothing exciting to them it seems that there's nothing meaningful to what they're doing nor thrilling it just seems to be so humdrum and meaningless I won't ask any of the kids that are here today, we have a few, how, in fact, you've told me, some of you, you think school is a waste of time. It's meaningless. Now, we all know that's not true. I will admit, in some, <laughs> some things that they're teaching is, but we won't get into that this morning. But, the, you know, a lot of people that may have this kind of thinking about their job, they love God, and they say, I want to serve God, and they, they have the idea that the only time I can serve God is when I get off of work. And that the only time I can serve God is maybe on a Sunday or maybe Wednesday night. And I just don't have any other time. And they want to, so they want to get off work and they say, I want, I want to get off work so I can serve God. So they, they, uh, but the problem is they give their prime time to their employer. And then they give the leftovers to God. And they give the weekends to God. They're serving God sort of half time. And, but it's not even really half time because they have given their prime time to that place of employment. And uh, they're, they're trying to serve two masters. What did Jesus say about that in Matthew 6? No man can serve, no woman can serve two masters. Now I believe there are some of you who are sitting here this morning. You're listening to me. And, and you're guilty of doing what I would call a split-level living. I, and I pray that God will help me to get this truth into your heart and mind. And it's this. You may be an ordinary person. I, you know, I, I, we, we may be ordinary in the eyes of some. You may think there's nothing exciting about you at all. And, but God loves ordinary people. He made a whole lot of ordinary people. And God loves them. And in fact, I would say most people are ordinary, we consider themselves ordinary. So that means God loves ordinary people. And he, he must like them since he made so many of them. Ordinary people are the handiwork of God. Now look with me, keep your finger there in Proverbs. We may come back to that. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And look at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. First Corinthians chapter 1. Look down with me at verse 26. And for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And, and here we, you see, God uses ordinary people. Uh, and, but here's the secret. God takes ordinary people and gives them extraordinary power. This is the amazing thing. God infuses within every child of God his Holy Spirit so we're no longer ordinary because we get saved, we become, or when we get saved, we become extraordinary. And, uh, but now, wait a minute, God takes ordinary people, gives them extraordinary power, and then God puts these 
It was those ordinary people in ordinary places of employment. Um, but you need to learn this. Listen, when God takes ordinary, an ordinary person, when God gives them extraordinary power and puts that ordinary person in that ordinary place with those extraordinary powers, he does extraordinary things through that ordinary person. And God wants to do that not just on after you get off work, not just on the weekends, but God wants to do that from the time you clock in to the time you clock out all of the time. God wants to use you. If, if you get this into your heart, it will transform your life. And we, we neatly divide life up into the secular and the sacred. And there are many who say something like this, you know, if I could do what I would really like to do, it, it, well, I just, I'd like to get out of this job. Some have said, I'd like to get out of this job and then I could serve God. Can't do it while I'm working here. And I'd just like to, some say, may, maybe they say, I'd like to serve God full time. And they use that, that term. And I don't know. Maybe you felt that. Maybe that thought, that feeling has crossed your mind. And, and boy, if I could just quit what I'm doing, and, and then I would be able to do uh, what God wants me to do. Maybe, you know, may God help me today to bring this truth to your mind and your heart and, uh, and help you understand as a Christian living in the spirit of God and that you are serving God full time. I don't care what your job is, uh, as long as it's legal, you're not, you're not uh, serving drugs or alcohol. You know, I think it's, it's a place that you can honor God and serve him full time. I don't care where you work, it's, if, it's an honorable occupation. You're serving God full time. Your work is to be the temple of your devotion. It's to be the, the platform of your witness. That God, how God wants to use you. It, again, we're guilty of dividing life up into secular and spiritual, and and or sacred. But not the Bible. The Bible doesn't do that. In the Old Testament, they did, but not in the New Testament. You see, in the Old Testament, they had priests, and then they had the rest of the people. Uh, but in the New Testament, and Brother Morris brought this out too. We're as a Christian, we're all priests. You don't have to come to this preacher to get to God. You can do it directly. And in the Old Testament, there was a temple that people went to. And listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 21. It's neither in this place nor in that place, but everywhere. We worship God in spirit and in truth. In the Old Testament, they divided foods as clean and unclean. But in the New Testament... Mark 7, 19, thus he spake, making all meats clean. Amen. I like that. In the Old Testament, certain days were set aside, but in the New Testament, every day is a holy day. And every place is a sacred place. Every job has dignity if it is honorable work. So every Christian is a priest, and every Christian is a minister, and every Christian is a full in full-time Christian service, regardless of of your employment. If it's honorable work, it's um, you can be in full-time and should be in full-time Christian service. Now, you may not believe that at this point, but I hope you will after we get done here with this message. In all labor, there is profit. In all labor, there is profit. Now, you may not uh, be in a, a, a real exciting job. I mean, your job may be... Uh, Maybe screwing caps on toothpaste tubes, you know. Maybe uh, uh, doing nothing more than tightening bolts or whatever it may be. I've worked jobs like that, assembly line jobs, and it can be boring at times. That is true, but we need to have a different mindset. Um, maybe, maybe that's what you do something like that all day long. Maybe you work in an office and you feel like, a, oh, it gets so boring, or you maybe mowing yards, um, digging ditches, building houses, maybe doing a whole variety of things, plowing fields, uh, bringing in the harvest. But if you learn what the Word of God says, I really believe it's going to change that boredom 
into something entirely different. That, that uh, 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 drudgery into something more delightful. You're going to find that you are, you are where God has placed you. You, you, you. you can be used of God in that place. And you're uh, there for a specific purpose. So, Roman number one, your work is sacred. Your work is sacred. I'm not talking to the preacher, to the missionary. I'm talking to all of you who have a job. Your work is sacred. And what is the sacredness of everyday work? Well, don't, don't get the idea that to serve God, you have to be a preacher. To serve God, you have to be a missionary, or you have to be in some kind of a Christian organization to serve God. I think sometimes we give that false impression. Every job, if it's done to the power of the Holy Spirit, is a sacred job. Now, I'm talk, talking now about the sacredness of everyday work in all labor. Proverbs tells us, in all labor there is profit. Ephesians 6, 5, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Employees, be obedient to your boss. Now that's what he says, even though this uh, guy, this boss of mine, he's a jerk. That's right. Be obedient. He's not even a Christian. Well, he is your master according to the flesh, not according to the spirit. With fear and trembling, it says, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Now wait a minute, preacher. You mean that boss of mine, I am to work for him as though he were Jesus Christ? That's right. This, that that two-legged devil that I work for? Well, according to the Bible, that's right. You are to work for him or work for her as, as though they were Jesus Christ. Because God owns that company. Really, God owns everything. And, and uh, uh, they may think they are in charge, but ultimately God's in charge. This, this is my father's world. This is your father's world. And, and so you are to serve Jesus Christ. A man named Daniel. We've been studying about Daniel. But uh, Daniel is going to be our chief illustration in this message here this morning. Proverbs 14, 23, again, in all labor there is, there is profit. Daniel was taken captive, wasn't he? If those of you who know the story. Taken captive from Israel, carried to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And there in Babylon, you know what kind of job he had? He had what we would classify as a secular job. Daniel's job was that he was in all, basically he was a government, uh, governmental bureaucrat. They uh, trained him. They pressed him into the service of the government. And as a government bureaucrat, he really, even though he was a, a government person, he was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, don't get the idea that Daniel was, uh, I, I know we, we know he's a prophet. But at his job there in Babylon, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a pastor. Uh, Daniel was what we would, I, I guess you could say, Daniel was a businessman. Daniel was a businessman in ordinary work. But notice what the king said. You remember when Daniel couldn't do what the king wanted him to, or decree was about the prayer. Daniel prayed to God. Uh, he was going to be punished. He was thrown in the lion's den. Remember, he refused to do certain things. That was his punishment. And the lions, when he was thrown in the lion's den, the lions got locked jaw. Daniel just relaxed. He pulled up an old fluffy lion and used it as a pillow. Uh, there that night, he pulled out his Old Testament, began to read, as one guy put it, he began to read between the lions. And he was just having a wonderful time. He was doing his devotions. And in Daniel chapter 6, I want you to hear this. You don't need to turn there unless you want. But Daniel 6, 20, this is the king now. When he came to the den the next morning, Daniel's been in the lion's den all night. The king hasn't slept all night. The king realized what a fool he was in making this decree. Couldn't change it. He didn't want any harm to come to Daniel. But he runs out there. He came to the den, it says, when he came to the den, he cried with a, a, a lamentable voice unto Daniel. The king spake, said to Daniel. Now listen to what the king said to Daniel. This is amazing. Remember, remember Daniel wasn't a preacher. He, he was not a priest. 
in the classic sense of the word anyway. Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, and whom thou servest, listen to this, whom thou servest continually. And he goes on, was he able to deliver thee from the lions? Now, notice what the king said here. Daniel, you're a servant of the living God. Oh, would that be the testimony, should be the testimony of all individuals in their work at school. You know, sometimes we think at school we can, we don't, we can tune the teachers out. We don't have to listen. But uh, it's important that we are doing our work as unto the Lord. And he goes on, he says, has that God whom you serve continually, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? And of course, God was able to deliver Daniel from the lions. Now, what am I trying to say here? Here was a man who had a secular job, Daniel. He, he, and yet, even his enemies, even the unsaved people around Daniel in his world had to admit that his secular job was uh, really a sacred job because Daniel continually served the Lord. He had that testimony. Now, did he do his job? You bet. He did it. In fact, he did it better than anybody else in the kingdom. And the king knew this. But he also knew that God was first in Daniel's life. And that's so important. Uh, you may be a, 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 here today and you say, well, pastor, I'm a, a homemaker. And, um, and you, you might think, well, well, well what's this, this job uh, worth? You know, it's, it's to serving the Lord. I, how can I do that? I'm here alone and there's no, uh, but I, I want to remind any homemaker, and really there's no higher occupation than serving God as a homemaker. One woman has over her kitchen sink these words, divine service is held here three times a day as she uh, washes dishes. That's the sign she sees. And what we call secular or everyday work is sacred. Uh, that is, if you do it as unto Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive the same reward that any pastor is going to receive for doing what to the best of your ability, what God has called you to do. Now, you may not believe it. You may not think it's so. You may think that your job is really not that important. Uh, nobody really sees me. Nobody knows what I'm doing. And uh, it's not that important at all. But God knows you. God sees all. He has his eye upon you. And the Bible says, those of you who are in secular work are serving God. That's why it's so important that we do the best that we can when we're at work, when we're at school, that we're, we, we give our best as unto the Lord and be that kind of testimony as was Daniel. So God, God knows and sees what you're, what you're doing. Every Christian, therefore, is in full-time Christian work, working as unto Christ. And I, I hope you'll never forget that. Your work is sacred. The second thing I want you to say, and I'll close on this point here, in only, in only a couple more hours. Uh, Roman number two, your work is planned. Your work is planned. Nothing by accident. You say, well, I, I, I sure would like to be in a Christian company around all those other Christians, around people who are always smiling, around people who are always praying, around people who are always praising God. Boy, that would be great. If that was the case, Pastor, boy, then I would be able to really serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I wouldn't have to be around some of the, uh, hearing some of the awful language and the awful behavior and, and uh, even maybe some flirtatious behavior and bad behavior and passing around bad things. And all these things happen on the job. And, uh, uh, and all the gossip and the cutthroat work that's being done and if God would only get me out of this place, then I could serve him. Friend, God put you in that place so you could serve him. Understand that. It's as important for you to be where you are and to know that God placed you there as it is for me to know that God's placed me where I'm at. See, well, preacher, you're, you're talking about being called to your work. You may not believe it, but like Daniel, God Put you in Babylon. It may be a rough. But you, you think they were nice and kind and, and godly people that Daniel had to work with? Not at all. 
that they wanted to kill Daniel numerous times and, and made several attempts. Uh, but Daniel uh, realized God had put him there for a reason. God called you, Christian, to the ministry. Just because you don't get up on Sunday and preach the gospel, or you may not even have a Sunday school class that you're teaching, God has called you, Christian, to the ministry where you are. And you say, well, I'm just a, a, a victim of my circumstances. Uh, not so. You, you, Daniel, do you think Daniel put an application in to serve in Babylon? Not at all. He got it. He was taken captive. You could say, if you looked at it the wrong way, well, Daniel could have said, I'm just a victim of my circumstances. I have no control over this, and I hate it. No, he realized that all these things happened according to God's will. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish to God that all Christians would understand that and have that sense that God placed me where I am. God placed you where you are. You're in, and I, I'll keep addressing you young people too. God placed you in that school. And there's a lot of things that go on in that school that you, you see that's wrong, bad behavior, and so forth. But look, God wants to use you. You are in full-time Christian work. And be an example for what God uh, wants you to be. God may have placed you where you are, and you, you uh, may not even know anything about it. You, you uh, nor have any sense of a call at all. But let me ask you this, some questions here. Was Daniel a servant of God? Absolutely he was a servant of God. Uh, did he serve God? Indeed, Daniel served God. Was he where God wanted him? Yes, of course he was. How did he get there? Again, by circumstances beyond his control. Uh, at least what he thought was beyond his control. Now, that may be how you feel. I didn't plan for this work. I, when I was a, a boy, when I was a girl, I didn't want to do what I'm doing now. I had more or higher ambitions or whatever it may be. But look, you need to look at it in this sense. Wherever you are now, if it's honorable work, you can be and should be in full-time Christian service. Um, Daniel was picked up by King Nebuchadnezzar. He was brought in exile to the land of Babylon. He was placed in the middle of all this wickedness in Babylon. Uh, idolatry, all kinds of things going on there. But let me tell you how, you, how he really got there. That, that's the history. That's the recorded facts. But really how he got there, God planned it all. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar, as we saw on Wednesday nights, He's called a servant of the Lord. God called him that. And a wicked pagan king. But God planned all of this to have Babylon, his, or have Daniel in Babylon with, along with his three friends. And we are, are called as Christians to confront this world. Uh, what are we to confront them with? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what we're to be doing everywhere we are. Well, it just thrilled my heart when I heard about those Af Afghani people Amen. who are uh, under death sentences. And yet they said, we are going to preach the gospel. Amen. You're not under a death sentence. I, I, look, whatever your job is, wherever you're at, God wants to use you. He put you there for a reason. And so, uh, you know, we are called... To, uh, preach the, to proclaim the gospel. And the best way to do that is to realize that every day we are to be a witness for the Lord. How am I going to work? How, what am I going to say? How am I going to respond? Those, those things ought to be in your mind. How will it best be a testimony unto the Lord? And you're a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's working side by side, day by day, with those, this, what we're talking about is lifestyle evangelism. Now, I know that term has been abused. I do believe in confrontational, confrontational witness. But I'm talking about people you work with every day. You see them every day. Okay? You, you're not going to go to them. and it, it, You deal with them a little differently. What I mean by that, they're watching you. They're going to uh, see if your words match up with your life. They're going to watch you in, in times of pressure and when the trouble's on. 
Okay, now we'll see how real his Christi or her Christianity is. Uh, they're watching you. And so it's uh, let your light shine in that, maybe that dark place where God has placed you. Matthew 5, 14. Ye, Christians, ye are the light of the world. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Listen, uh, you could call this the four walls of this church, the, the bushel. We're not to be just staying within here. The only place that we're going to be able to be a Christian is here within the church walls. No, God's intention for us to sh is to shine out there in the world where people can see us. It's to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, you, all of us, ought to do that on the job. Now I want to tell you that your job is the lampstand that, that God placed you there to let your light shine. That's the place he's put you. And let your light shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's God's plan for your ministry. And folks, it's a full-time ministry, wherever you are. You're in full-time ministry. Don't uh, Please understand that. So many times they say, oh, God, I want to get out of this place, out of this Babylon. I want out. And Lord, I just want to do something for you. I want to get... Uh, you know, get away from this worldly influence. Well, if you did that, all those people would not be influenced for Jesus Christ. Now, it's sad, it is true, that too many times Christians are influenced by the world. Now, I'm not telling you that what you ought to do is just go along with everybody at work. And No, you and I, we are to be distinctively Christian, a witness, an ambassador, even on our work, our, our job. In fact, I don't think there's a better place to do that. We are not to be a gossiper. We're not to be a backstabber. We're not to be, we're not to be a person of no character. We are to, uh, we ought to be on time. We ought to be dependable, loyal. I know all those things. I, you know, I, I've seen men who are more concerned about their, um, about their work than they are about their families. That ought not be. But we ought to understand, if I lose this job over taking a stand for what's right, well, that's just God opening another door for me. This job is not my God. My paycheck is not my God. God can take care of me. I am not going to compromise, even if it means my life, as those Afghani Christians are stating. They can kill me, but we're not going to deny Jesus Christ. We will not do so. We're not talking about that type of situation necessarily. Just being at work, being a full-time Christian servant of the Lord. God's plan for you is not to flee Babylon, not to flee the place where you are, but to let him use you where you are. Now, if you're in a position where they're asking you to do something immoral or, or <laughs> illegal, yeah, get out of that. Quit that job. Again, it's not your, your God. But uh, I'm talking about honorable work. Uh, stay there. Be used of God as a witness. God's plan for you is to confront the world and to overcome the world and to witness the world. You know, it's at the job, the work site, or even at school where people, they don't just hear the preacher preaching. They see the person living out the Christian values that they claim to, to believe. They see the reality of it. Every day, day, to, day by day, the work that's going on. In John 17, 15, Jesus said, I pray not that you should, should just take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Yes, God will help us stay away from the evil, but he don't want us out of the world. We're here for a purpose, for a reason. God is pl God's plan is not that you be taken out of the world environment, but that you would live a Christian a life in the midst of that wicked world. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10, again, for the sake of time, we'll not read that, but Paul says this. I, basically, he said, I wrote this epistle, the letter here, not to keep company with sexually immor immoral people. And that's basically what he said. Yet, I, he goes on, he said, I didn't really, I don't mean not to have any contact with them, uh, the, the immoral people, the covetous individuals, the extortioners, the idolaters, uh, to, in order to do that, you'd have to be removed from the world. 
What he's saying, he does, does not want them to participate, to go along. This world is where we live. And it's where God has placed us, where God wants to use us. Romans 12, 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil, as if I know it, with what? Good. With good, that's right, with good. We're not to flee from the world, we're to confront the world. 1 John 5, 4, for who, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, our faith. God has placed you in Babylon just like he put Daniel in Babylon. God has placed you there, and as Daniel served the Lord in the workplace, God wants you to serve him in that place where you are. In all labor, there is profit. Now, that doesn't mean you do everything in Babylon. That doesn't mean when you're in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. Daniel didn't do that. Jesus said, I pray not that you, thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest uh, 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 keep them from the evil. There were certain things in Babylon that Daniel said, no, can't do that. His three friends said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, from the very first day, that happened. And he, he uh, got thrown in the lion's den. He suffered some persecution. Uh, there are some things that you will not be able to do. That's fine. If your employment is asking you to do something, as I said earlier, that's illegal, that's immoral, that goes against the word of God, that's when you have to, you have to tell them, either you uh, change their, your policy here or I'm, I'm, out, I'm out the door. Uh, you, you know, you cannot compromise in those areas. And so that, that's what's going to make you distinctively different than all those around you. That's what's going to make you so effective when you, when you are there in your Babylon, if you would. You've been saved out of the world, then sent back into the world to witness to the world. And that's the only business in the world that you and I ought to have uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, taken, until we're taken out of this world, we're to be here in this world as a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 15, that you may be blameless and harmless. That's not when we're taken out of the world, but that's why we're still in the world, in that Babylon. Uh, blameless and harmless, and that's what Daniel was. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. This is Philippians 2.15. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Where is the light to shine? As that verse states, in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation. Oh, it's easy to let your light shine when we're singing uh, uh, the praises of, uh, to, to the Lord in church. But this, this is talking about a perverse and crooked uh, generation. If you were going to build a lighthouse, where would you put it? Well, you wouldn't put it, you wouldn't put a lighthouse uh, in the middle of New York City. You wouldn't even put a lighthouse necessarily out here because there is no, as we can clearly see, there's no ocean, no water. We would put a lighthouse on those jagged rock shores where that ship could see it uh, and, and be saved from uh, uh, shipwrecking. So that's, uh, that, that's where we would build a lighthouse to be the most effective. Where would God put a lighthouse? He would not put a, 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 look, yes, part of his plan is for us to come together into fellowship and to hear, sit under the preaching and the teaching of God's word. But his plan also involves us to go back into the world to be a witness for him, to be a lighthouse, a lighthouse that's shining out to the world and warning them of the dangers and pointing them to Jesus Christ. Now, if you're, you're going to, again, that, that's what, why God has put you where he's put you. Listen again to this verse in Philippians 2, 15. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow down to the image that Nebuchadnezzar built. You could say in the midst or in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation. They refused to bow. But it, that wasn't when Nebuchadnezzar was awestruck by their witness. Nebuchadnezzar didn't stop and say, man, those three guys that aren't, aren't bowing, 
I want to bring them in. We're going to promote them. No, he was not impressed at all. In fact, he wanted to kill them. He was so mad, his visage changed. But it was, it was when they were in the midst of that fiery furnace. That's when Nebuchadnezzar realized that God was God. Listen to what happened. Daniel 3, 28. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Zach, Shadrach, Meshach. This is after he brought them out of the fire. And Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and had changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except, except their own god. And listen to verse 29. Therefore, the king says, I make a decree. Why is he doing this? Because of what the stand that Shadrach... Meshach and Abednego did and when they were in the midst of that fire what happened and so he says I make a decree that every people uh, nation and language which spake anything amiss or which speak anything amiss uh, against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their house shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sword that's a pagan king speaking here how would that king have ever known the power of God had it not been for Daniel, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? He would not have known that. How would the people around us in our community know the power of God, the love of God, the transformation that God takes uh, uh, works in a life had it not been for the believers who work by them side by side every day, day in and day out. Your job and your definition may be boring, but God wants to use you to do extraordinary things in the lives of people. That's how you must view it. And God wants to use you. Mark chapter 16, 15, it says, listen, um, in the midst of that crooked and perverse generation, Jesus Christ wants us to go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Tell the truth. There's no better way to proclaim it than by living it day in and day out. And if our words don't match our, our life, then it's not going to mean anything at all. So 1 Peter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, that is, where uh, we're to live clean, right, pure lives. But now listen to verse 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Now who are the Gentiles? That's the unsaved. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Think about those two young boys bombs strapped on them and ready to commit suicide and kill as many Christians as they could. And yet those two men risked their lives, approached these two boys. They were able to spot them. They knew that they were carrying a vest. And uh, were able to proclaim the truth to them and uh, speak against you as, you know, they, they were out there to kill them. But they were able to come in and uh, 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 reach them for Jesus Christ. I, I'm not saying that you have some uh, crazed individuals that, well, you may think they're crazy, but um, there's people there that need Jesus Christ. Just as big a difference as it made in the lives of those two boys who were, uh, not only did they get the bombs off, then no one was killed by them, but also the two souls here now who are now become proclaimers of Jesus Christ. That you are making that kind of difference in the lives of people around you. Think about the homes that have no hope. Families, they're, they're, they're uh, in such a mess. The alcohol, the drugs, the, all the things of this world. People have, they're not only thinking their job is, is boring, but their life is a waste. And they may be at the point of committing suicide were it not for a believer who stood by them, worked by them, testified to them. Oh, how important it is. You are to let your light shine. If people would begin to take to heart what I'm talking about this morning, and we begin to live it out on Monday through Saturday on their place of, at their place of work, I'll guarantee you that God would receive glory that people, the lost, would be saved. Uh, 
And, and they would believe. Look, it doesn't mean as much, the preacher up here preaching, as, as much as it does when the people see you living it. It's real. It changed that, that individual. So when you start living out the truth of the Word of God on Monday through Friday, people are more prone to believe what happens on Sunday. So let God use you to be that light. Father, I do thank you for each and every individual in our church. We have a variety uh, of people. I, I know I, I wanted to mention some other things. We'll and later on maybe do that. But God, every individual is important. Let no one here think that their job uh, is meaningless and that they are wasting their time. But God, help them to see that they can be a witness for Jesus Christ. They, they are a servant, a full-time servant of Jesus Christ where they are. So you help each one, Lord, do that work you've called them to do. For it is in Jesus' name we pray.